I'm going to pass over to, to Sarah now. Thank you very much, Veronica. And I'd like to thank, at the beginning, Veronica, Noel and Roberta for organising these talks and all the admin involved, because they've really been the highlight of our weeks, I think, over the last uh, few months. So thank you for that. <clears throat> now, I uh, wanted to talk about the Diga Nikaya, which is one of the books of uh, Buddhist suttas. And I just thought I'd... I'd say a little bit about my introduction to it, which was in the, I think it was probably the first Sutta group Lance Cousins took in Manchester. Yeah. And uh, he read these texts. And I was say he's going to university and having to do things. So he's, I said, well, what do you have to do, you know, for a, a Sutta group thinking to take notes or something? He said, no, 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 you just listen. All you have to do is listen. And I used to think it's such a nice break to go and listen to something. So I chose this, I thought the texts he chose for that group were from the Diga Nikaya. And Diga means long. So they are very, very, very long, some of them. And I just used to think it was wonderful to go to a group meeting, do a practice and just listen. And what I also found interesting was that the text had such a deep effect on me because when I um, used to leave the meetings and they're usually about three or four in, in the morning uh, because Lance uh, was very much a nighttime person, um, I used to walk out of the street and I just used to have this sense of an enormous amount of space around <laughs> and an enormous amount of time. Now, quite clearly, I was still in Daisy Bank Road walking down the street, but, and I could feel that too. But there was this sense of great vistas of time and space. And I just left it at that. I just thought how wonderful it was to be doing meditation. And it was only years later that I realized that was actually the effect not only of the meditation and uh, practicing with other people, but of course, the text itself has that effect. And it, it's, uh, it's something about the Deacon Nikaya. The name means long, and it's all in the name. It goes, they're very, very long texts. So I thought, here am I on a desert island, because uh, we're all on desert islands at the moment. <laughs> um, what would be my one, one book? And I thought, it has to be the Deacon Nikaya. Except I would cheat, because what I'd do is I'd have the Pali version, I'd sneak in the commentaries. I'd have this version, the Morris Walsh, and I would have the dialogues of the Buddha, the um, Rhys Davis version. But importantly, I would have it on audible book in uh, Pali and English. So I'd put headphones on, on, on a desert island and I would listen to it both in English and in Pali, really well chanted. So um, that, that, that would be my, my desert island choice. Um, and the reason for this is that it does give you a great sense of, of space and a great sense of perspective. And I once asked uh, somebody who was working at the Pali Text Society what the best seller at the Pali Text Society was. And he said, hands down, the translations of the Deacon Nikaya. So it clearly speaks to, to people in general as well. But this is very interesting because, I, uh, as Veronica mentioned, I am a scholar. And I, the things I've heard said about Diga Nikaya, it's actually slightly pushed aside as being less important than the other Nikayas, even though it has some of the major suttas in. And people talk about it being full of myths and literary embellishments. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about that because I like myths, um, because they're right. Um, but they don't say it in a complimentary way, but I'm going to say it in a way that is complimentary. And I, I, I hope I'll just give a few examples of some extracts from texts that I hope will show and we'll perhaps discuss them at the end. And I'll just talk through one or two of the suttas very, very briefly because I hope to show that actually each sutta in the Diga Nikaya is a meditation. It is, some of them are full of literary myths, embellishments and flourishes, 
but it is all part of being a meditation. And some of you will have already realized this, of course, with one or two of the texts in it that have been studied very deeply, in, particularly in Manchester, but also around Samatha generally, the Mahustasana sort of Universal Monarch Sutta and the 32 Marks Sutta. But the more I uh, explore Dignakaya, the more it seems to me that each one of the texts is a meditation. So that if you were on a desert island, you wouldn't sort of rush and read them all. You'd just look at one and maybe spend a week on it, just thinking about it, reading it to yourself, listening to it. And I think you'd find that each sutta actually is a meditation, but often there, there are very different kinds. Um, there is also something very beautifully beautiful in a structural sense about Dīgha And I won't say too much about this, because, uh, but I think it is very important here. Uh, right in the middle, you have the Parinibbāna Sutta, the, the great journey of the Buddha's last days. And it seems to me that the Dīgha is really very much about the Buddha and the, the Triple Gem. But it's also about how the Buddha as a human being was transient. And there are lots of suttas about his transience. And as I hope we'll see, the whole of the Dīgha is really about <coughs> Buddha. I think of the Parinibbana Sutta as being like a stupa in the middle of the the, the Dignikaya, that all the other texts sort of seem to be like a wheel around it. And they all lead to it and lead from it. So I'll just say a few words about some aspects of that, and not too much. They are very long suttas, but I, I, I hope that people will feel that they're, they're ones they like to explore at some point. I think we will do a little practice at the end, and we'll do a little practice from the Dīgha actually, which is perhaps less well known. But I feel that's the way that the text works. Um, a bit like um, a Samatha practice, that you go to the middle, to you go through stages to the middle, to get to the settling and then out again. I feel the Dīgha works as a whole book, a collection of, of suttas like that. And you can dip in to little, little bits of it when, when you want to. So I think what I'll do is I'll just explain a little bit about some of the suttas, but before we do that, I had a nice um, helpful chat with Noel and, and Veronica. Uh, I wanted to explain a little bit about how an oral literature works, because these are an oral literature. And it's quite important to know how it works if you want to get the full benefits of the Dīgha Nikāya, because a lot of people come across suttas and things, well, why are they repeating things all the time? You know, why are they going on and on and going round in circles, so to speak? And I would just like to talk about some elements of oral literature, where you are supposed to be going round in circles in oral literature, basically. So we're going to have a look at three very short clips, I hope. Um, now, the first one is uh, was... A, a very short film undertaken in the 30s on, on very sort of old-fashioned equipment by somebody called um, Albert Lord and somebody called Perry, Perry as well. And they noticed that the, the bardic traditions of Eastern Europe were terribly like Homer, um, the, the ancient Greek poet. And they noticed that there were certain features in these great bardic traditions that popped up in Homer, but also popped up in a still living Yugoslavian um, folk law tradition. And what it means is that what it, what it is, it uses a lot of things like um, repetition, redundancy, and I will explain these. Don't worry, I won't go too technical. There's lots of formula that get used again and again and again. There's lots of descriptions that get used again and again, and transportable phrases that you can use again and again. 
and you'll know them. You're all actually very familiar with oral literature just from hearing the chanting. So it's really a matter of just thinking, oh, that's, that's that and that's that. So when we get all those features of the, the, the way the Bhagawa is described with all those epithets in the Itipisa, which we will, we will chant. Um, it, it's a very typical feature of oral literature just to have all these qualities of somebody. It's called redundancy, that you have things that are pretty much the same, but they, they accumulate. Um, you also get lots of repetition. So uh, let's listen to the first, a few seconds of the first one, which is you get something of this quality of the rhythm and the repetition, which uh, Lord and Parry found characterized uh, oral literatures in this little video. It's not very pleasant. So we'll only have what about, I think about 30 seconds of it, but it gives you an indication of how an oral literature works. And this is the, the uh, Serbocration one. <clears throat> Okay, so I would encourage people to turn up their computer if you do not hear this properly. <laughs> So it's, it, thank you, Noel. It's very interesting. It's not actually sort of euphonious. You don't think, oh, I really want to listen to that again. Uh, but what it's doing is actually all the things that you find in our chanting and um, the oral literatures of India, this repetition, phrases repeated, formally used, mixed and matched in different positions. And you find all those features and you can just get a sense of it by hearing that. And this seems to be a feature of all oral literatures all, all, over, well, all over the world. And it, it helps to understand Deegan Nikaya if you have a sense of what they would be doing, which is they would be trying to repeat things. Um, I do a lot of knitting and I think it's like, um, when you're knitting a cable jersey, you have about three different patterns within patterns, and you always come back to stable points in the knitting. Uh, you know, when you come round and round and round, you always come back to a line or a motif, even if you do motifs within motifs. Because if you're just doing something that's going round and round and round and round, you need markers and tags to keep you going. And it seems to me that it's the same with an oral literature. You need these little repetitive phrases and almost space fillers so that you can come back to a point. And we'll see this in, in the Deganikaya and the texts in that. Now, the second one is, um, uh, this is an Irish monolingual bard. And he's just going to recite an Irish epic kind of poem sort of thing which is enormous and which he's never completely recited because it sort of has all these possibilities that you can go in all directions by building in certain ways. So we're going to listen to him. He is, he is monolingual and we'll just listen to, uh, I think we're doing a minute of him. Noel's going to try and help us to listen. Yep. Has not yet run out of stories. Sorry, sir, that's stopped. Okay, well, well, people can look it up afterwards. And uh, <clears throat> basically, it's this wonderful epic poem that sort of it goes all over the place and you just sort of add bits on and you add stories and things. And uh, the bards would be trained in how to learn it. So you should get people who are trained in these things to recite and to pass on the information. 
And the last one we're going to look at is the, uh, or to listen to, is the, the soundscape that the Buddha would have had. Um, if you go to India or, or Southeast Asia or South Asia, one of the things you get used to is just hearing all the time. You're always listening. You're always hearing chants from temples or, and I remember going to Sri Lanka for the first time in the 70s and just everywhere I went, people had the, the suttas being chanted on the radio. You know, some of them were that very sharp delivery of um, the recited remembered tradition. Some of them, these lovely puja-like chants. Some of them, the metta sutta and just People used to do their housework and just have the radio on listening to chanting all the time. So this is the, I think, something that is very Indic. I'm sure the Indian people would be able to um, tell us about this. But there is a sense that wherever you go, you're in a soundscape. So this, I thought, well, let's just listen to the soundscape, which we know the Buddha would have listened to. We have the, uh, this is the Vedic Brahmins. The Hindu Vedas comprise a vast corpus of Sanskrit poetry, philosophical dialogue, myth and ritual incantations that were developed and composed in India by the Aryans over 3,500 years ago. Regarded by Hindus as the primary source of knowledge and the sacred foundation of their religion, the Vedas embody one of the world's oldest surviving cultural traditions. <laughs> Veda is derived from the Sanskrit word Ved, meaning knowledge. The Vedic heritage embraces a multitude of texts and interpretations that are collected in four Vedas, commonly referred to as books of knowledge, even though they have been transmitted orally. Veda is an anthology of sacred hymns. The Sama Veda features musical arrangements of hymns from the Rig Veda and other sources. The Yajur Veda abounds in prayers and sacrificial formulae used by priests. And the Atana Veda includes incantations and spells. Does also provide an extraordinary historical panorama of Hinduism and offer insight into the early development of several fundamental artistic, scientific, and philosophical notions, such as the concept of zero. <laughs> expressed in the elegant Vedic So that gives you some idea of the great richness of oral literatures and how they're very active physically. And in the Vedas and the Upanishads, you get people pointing up and saying, look at the sky, actually in the chant. So there's a little inbuilt mindfulness exercise in the, in the text itself. Be aware of the directions. They're always talking about, uh, be aware of east, uh, north, south and west. So you're, the, the chanter and the listener is having to orient themselves in an environment where they have to be there. <laughs> they have to be alert and mindful to their location. So I think that's very helpful when we come to think of suttas in general and the Deegan Nikaya in particular, because the very interesting thing about the text of the Deegan Nikaya is that although Buddhist Nikayas, collections, have texts that get transported and bits of um, material that you find in all four collections. There's actually something about the style of these long dialogue, the long dialogues of the Buddha, they're sometimes called, that is quite distinct from the other Nikayas. And it is distinct in some ways which I think are very interesting and very useful on our desert islands at the moment, because we are all on our Oh, sort of different little bubbles everywhere. So I'll just say some of the things which um, you find in oral literatures, but which you find in the Deegan Nikaya actually really used for, for meditation. Now the first one is a sense of the directions. And I've been very interested to hear the talks by people over the last few weeks, how often people have brought our attention to our location in space. 
I think almost every text in the Deacon Nikaya does this. Um, I'd say certainly about 26, there are 34. So we are at some point reminded of the four directions. And actually in about six or seven of the suttas, we are actually given instructions that places in the directions and above and below. They're actually specific meditative in instructions. So we have the last days of the Buddha. We know that a lot of the texts are set in the last days of the Buddha. We know he's not going to be here long. But we also find him thinking of all sorts of, if you like, ruses to make people not attached to him, but to the teaching. So that it is a, a, a curious text and it is very de devotional, but we, you don't become attached to the Buddha as a person in a certain way. So we have things like the 10 unanswerable questions about where the Buddha could be after death. And that's in the very first sutta, the Brahmajala. And he doesn't answer them because he's going to be unfindable. So this is said in Sutta 1, right at the beginning, he makes it quite clear that the Buddha is um, not to be found after death. But he also does this in a text which shows him on a little journey. It's the first one and he's actually traveling on, on a path with a companion where people are being rude about the Buddha. So he defends his teaching and his Sangha. Um, but he reminds people, and he reminds people of his presence, but he also reminds people that he won't be around afterwards. And I would say nearly all of the texts in the Deacon Nikaya do this in one form or another, either by talking about the uh, many Buddhas who lived before him in deep time, or by talking about... Um, the way he, he, he teaches, Sariputta says to him, you must be the greatest man who's ever lived. And he said, no, there have been other Buddhas before and there are other Buddhas afterwards. So it's as if he's taking his own physical presence almost as a Kamatana. He's saying, this is just an old body. It's frail <laughs> and is showing us that, but at the same time showing us the great direction and spaciousness of the teaching. Mm -hmm. So here are some things, I've just made a little list of things that you'll find in, in Diga Nikaya that are, you'll find in all oral literatures, but it's changed slightly. So you get words of apparently the same meaning, one after the other, as we get in the Itipisa, we get words that sort of, sort of seem, mean, mean much the same sort of thing. But of course, when, they're med when they're in, you hear them, they become a meditation, so it's uses repetition, something which we use in meditation all the time, is we go back to the same object again and again and again. And in a way, you need to understand the suttas in that light. They often do that. They go back again and again and again, just like the breath does, because they're geared for people who are sitting somewhere and listening, not skimming through the iPad. <laughs> you know, they are actually listening texts. They build patterns in time. All oral literature seem to do this, like they build structures in time. And there are certain structures, uh, like the circular one, for instance, which is very popular in classical epics. And you find this in Buddhist texts as well, of circles within circles. Now, you, if you have a, a, a Buddhist text, you have the Buddha asking a question, and then he says, uh, there are these four such and such. What are these four such and such? And at the end, he says, these are these four such and such. So each little um, section of the sutta goes round in a little circle. And we have that within the text as a whole. Because what does meditation do? It goes round and round in circles again and again and again. And it's like it's using that part of the mind to, to listen. The other thing about uh, oral literatures of this kind are there, they tend to be very long. They don't just, just describe action. Now, in that Irish one, you had a long, it was, he was actually talking about a sea voyage, and at the end, the interviewer says, Well, that took a long time to say he got there, 
And that's all that that long passage was about, somebody on a journey. But in oral literature, you get a sense that you are participating in the journey. So in the Deegan Nikaya, other, other Nikayas talk about heaven realms, we go there. Other Nikayas talk about the jhanas, the Deegan Nikaya takes us to experience them in detail. It goes through each element that is present and it uses redundancy. The, the description of the four jhanas that the waters that pervade, they drench, they suffuse, they permeate the body. Now, all these words are, are very much mean much the same sort of thing. But of course, if you hear them again and again and you're listening, you start to feel that quality happening in yourself. And it seems to me those long descriptions that we find so often in the long discourses of the jhanas are ways of allowing us to get a taste of them and, and to experience them. And also in some to shock us a bit where we get descriptions that kind of shock us out of something or um, take us to a world maybe we don't particularly want to go to. So I think um, the other things that you get are, are numbers, which is a, a very important in Deacon Nikhail, these patterns with numbers. And I think the main thing, though, is that they are myth mythic. And I use this word at the beginning. If you read Homer or the great, uh, the great Irish epics, Beowulf, it's all about great battles, myths, fight with enchantresses, big struggles. And this is what the Deacon Nikaya is too, but it's translated into our human um, experience of meditation. So that's full of these myths too. And it's like it takes our minds on journeys through these worlds, but it always dissolves them and it always does so in a mindful way. And it always reminds us of the directions and where we are. There are individual suttas that um, do it in particular ways. So the Brahmajala sutta takes us on a, a voyage through views and the Buddha is challenged about his teaching and he talks about the 62 kinds of wrong views. As you hear this text, each view is created for you, the view that all things are eternal, the memory of a heaven realm where you think you've been you must be eternal because you happen to be in a heaven realm for a long time. The annihilationists, the eel wrigglers, the people who are terribly liberal, liberal minded who say, well, it could be like this, or it could be like this, or it might be like that. Each one, you kind of get a little shock of recognition. Oh, actually, that's quite a reasonable view. So it goes through 62 of these views. And each point you kind of engage, he creates that view for you. I mean, the eel regulars I love because they um, are the ones who are terribly broad-minded. I think, well, it could be that, and, and it could be that, um, or maybe it isn't. And the Pali is very idiomatic. It, it, it makes that very much alive. And so for us, I think, um, when we hear that, we, um, we identify. But the, the point is not that these views are wrong, but that what animates them is that we are craving for them. So this is, is quite a difficult sutra in, in many ways. And each time the Buddha does not give us a wrong view, a right view, he, this, we just get this formula several times in the sutta. The Buddha understands these viewpoints thus grasped and adhered to will lead to such and such destinations in another world. They just lead to rebirth. This the Tathagata knows and more, but is not attached to that knowledge. And being thus unattached, he has experienced for himself perfect peace. And having truly understood the arising and passing away of feelings, their attraction and their peril, and the debt their deliverance, the Tathagata is liberated without remainder. These monks are those other matters, profound, hard to see, hard to understand, peaceful, excellent, beyond mere thought, subtle, to be experienced by the wise, which the Tathagata, having realized, realized them by his own super knowledge, proclaims, and about which those who would truthfully praise the Tathagata 
would rightly speak. So we're not told what right view is, we're told what it feels like to have right view. <laughs> and it's quite interesting, there isn't a description of right view in the text at all. It tells us what the Buddha experiences. It's like we are being taken on a guided tour through views and coming back to this repetitive passage to a being who doesn't attach after that. So we're being shown the risk. We have our mythical journey to a dangerous realm, the world of views, but each time we're, we're actually told how to be within that text and not get caught. So we have the hero who resists Circe and all the, the sirens or whatever, uh, and the Buddha is often described as a hero. This is, uh, it is a bardic text, and the Buddha really is our hero. Um, there are many more suttas, but it, they are very, very long, and I, I think I won't spend too long talking about them. So I think we should do a little bit of practice, and I'll do a pra practice from the Deacon Nikaya. So we'll start off with a bit of samatha practice and then we can have some discussion afterwards. I wanted to talk about this um, collection though because it is actually, I, I, I don't think it'd be wrong to say it's often actually dismissed by scholars as being full of myths and populist. And I think we need to see it as being part of a great heritage of world literature of this heroic kind that is oral and that is something to be listened to on our, on our desert islands. So let's do some meditation. Now I'm going to light uh, a candle there and by the shrine. So if you pin on the shrine, you'll have a shrine to look at for your practice. Um, Francis, would you like to chant the Itipiso for us? Thank you. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambhutasa <coughs> Iti Piso Bhagava Arahan Samma Sambhudu Vija Charana Sang Pannu Sugato Loka Vedu Varu Daru Purisadamma sarati santa eva manu sanam udo bhagavati Swakato bhagavata dhammo sandhitiko akaliko vipasiko Upanayako pachatang veditabo vinyuiti Supadipanno bhagavato savaka sango Ujupadipanno bhagavato Sawaka Sango Jaya Pati Pano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Sami Chipati Pano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Yadidam Chantani Bodhisayugami Atta Bodhisapugala Esa Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Ahuneyo Ahuneyo Dagineyo Anjali Karaneyo Anuptara Punyaketang 
Kasati. So let's be aware of where we're sitting and the contact with the ground. And be aware of the body and where it's placed and the physical sensations. Be aware of in front of you, direction, say the east. I wish all beings well in that direction. Aware of the direction behind you. Aware of the direction to the left. And be aware of the direction to the right. And if you can loosely arrange them to the compass directions, then do east, south, west, and north. And then wish the direction, beings in the direction above, wish their well-being. And wish beings in the direction below, well-being. And now become aware of your own physical body. That's what it feels like. You're sitting on the ground in one particular place and a particular time. And be aware of that body. And be aware that you have behind you a sense of past and ahead of you a sense of future. But at the moment you are at the middle in this particular place, in this particular location. We're in the present. And any views that arise about what you might have been in the past, just let go of. And any views about what you might be in the future, just let go of. And just know without becoming attached to that knowledge. Know what is there without becoming attached to that knowledge. And then begin the practice with the longest of counting. And return to normal breathing and feel the normal breath and your place in the present where you are now.
and allow a feeling of well-being to arise, to pervade and suffuse and drench the body, just let it pervade the whole body. And breathe in loving kindness for yourself and breathe it out to beings in all directions on the out breath. Breathe in loving kindness, breathe out loving kindness. And keeping that quality in mind, with the eyes shut, just look. Look ahead. East, that's easier. Yeah. Just look in the south, the eyes shut. In the west. Behind you, to the left, to the north, just look and let the looking extend as far as you can. And look above and look below. And just, just let the looking go in all directions. around, above, and below. And now just listen to anything that's in front. right, behind, to the left, above and below. Just extend the feeling of listening infinitely as far as you can. Now fill that space with listening and looking. Just have a sense of the mind going in all directions with metta, it's listening and looking. And be aware of all the other beings around, and also the beings in the meeting, the practicing, and beings around the locality where you are now. So just be aware of beings immediately around you. Those that you share your house with or your flat, the animals, the neighbors, people on the street, and wish them well. And finish the practice. Bhajanga sati sang kata ho dhammanang vichaya ho tata viryang piti pahasadi bhajanga chatata pare samadupeka bhajanga 
Sate te sabadaha sina, Muni na samadaha kata, Bahaweta bahuli kata, Sangwa tantia bhinaya, Nipanaya chabuhudia, Ete na satchawahajena, So te te hu to sahabada. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Good. Well, um, we can perhaps open to chat. Uh, there's a lot more uh, to say about the Deganikaya, but we've just done about three or four exercises from the Deganikaya, and I think that shows it rather speaks for itself in a way as to what it can do and the effect it can have. Um, mm -hmm. Shall we perhaps move to discussion? We can talk about specific texts. Some, of the, some people may not know which, which um, texts are in the Diga Nikaya, but uh, Gwil mentioned one recently, Sigala Vada Sutta, and he brought out that mandala effect about that sort of about how you should behave to all your family and members and he made a a, a sort of three-dimensional four-dimensional mandala where you kind of interact and um, with other people and that's the the quality of the text really so are there any questions or comments thank you very much i've got this wonderful copy from 1987 uh, i don't know if you can see that uh, anyway my question is uh, on the beginning of the Chakravati Sihanada Sutta, mm -hmm. it says um, it is just by the building up of wholesome states that this merit increases. Um, what's your understanding of that? Uh, so the uh, Chakravati uh, Sihanada. Yes, number 26. Okay. Yeah. So what does it say? Um, monks, be islands unto yourselves, be a refuge unto yourself. That one. Yeah. Let the Dharma be your island. Let the Dharma be your refuge with no other refuge. So that's... that's it's, the next, it's the next paragraph. Oh, I see. Oh, keep to your own preserves, monks, to your ancestral haunts. Well, I, I happen to have looked, uh, it, it's like your ancestral home, like your, uh, your mansions, where, where you belong, your, your place. It's the four foundations of mindfulness. Apparently, I, Bhikkhu Bodhi told me that recently. I was in some conversation with him, and he says that is taken as the four foundations of mindfulness, usually, as the natural home for monks. Is that what you meant? Yeah, and then just at, just at the bottom of that, it says, uh, of that paragraph, it says, it is just by the building up of wholesome states that this merit increases. Right, I'll read it out. It's very nice. And it's the word actually pastures as well, your preserves, your, the, the places you go every day, your haunts. Keep to your own haunts, monks, your to your ancestral homes, your ancestral pathways, if you like. If you do so, then Mara will find no lodging and no foothold. It is just by the building up of wholesome states that this merit increases. Um, I take that to mean that it really is just worth doing a wholesome state at any moment because that will build up the reserves and have, give less room for Mara at that moment. What's the meaning of the word merit? Uh, does it mean punya or is it something, is it just skillfulness? Oh, uh, I would have to look that up. I'll just see if I've got Deganikaya 3. I'll just see. Yes, it's punya. Thank you. Somebody got there right. before me. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does that... Does that uh, answer anything or it, it yeah it's well well i think it's, it's i think it's a wonderful thing isn't it i mean so it's, it's punya in the kind of asian context of the word when people are talking about making merit mm. 
it's just doing doing things which make merit. Yes, you will just keep on the right track. <clears throat> it's like it's keeping you on a path. Yeah. Is okay. that what you mean? Well, oh, oh. would you like to say more? Well, well, I mean, you know, like uh, Asian people are obsessed about making merit. That's their hobby. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's just quite nice to have that word mentioned in the Deacon Nikai like that. Mm. Oh, as it is frequently. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Sarah, it, thank you so much. That was, uh, you know, lovely, lovely talk. And um, we also really enjoyed the meditation. It was very nice to, to go back to old school meditation with a nice settling, um, you know, the sort of nice calm settling where you allow the breath to go to whatever it wants to go to. Um, so enjoyed that very much. Thank you. And just so much in the talk. I mean, it's hard to know where to begin, really. Mm. So much there. Enjoyable. Loved, loved the references to the sounds, you know, the way they chant and description of everybody listening to chanting on the radio in Sri Lanka and India. <clears throat> There's the pictures of the, the sadhu, the gathering of the, the Vedic. Can you hear me, by the way? Is it mm, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I thought I spotted VJ in one of those Vedic pictures <laughs> 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 to the right, <laughs> um, maybe in a past life. Um, so, yeah, it was just really lovely and delightful. Thank you. But I wanted to ask the books like the, this, this Diga Nikaya. I, I mean, I don't have a copy. The Morris, I've heard of it many times. I never got a mm. copy, but... Now, when the you know, normally I'd go to the Buddhist society and get one or water stones or something, but now, I mean, where do you recommend buying these, these things? Should I go to Amazon or should is it better to go direct to? Can you? There, there are all sorts of places. I would just go on Google and see. I mean, if some people want to avoid Amazon at the moment, which so you could get it from another bookseller, water stones, I always think is good. But there is a site which um, called Sutta Central, and it has all the suttas of the Deacon Nikaya in English. It's called Sutta Central, and you can find the whole of the Pali Canon in Pali and English. So, dot org or yeah, uh, Sutta Central dot org, I think yes. And it will. It, it's. It, they just put translations of everything in the Pali Canon up for you. So you'll find the whole of the the Diga Nikaya. I can send a link that if, if people want that to the Diga Nikaya, you can find every single sutta in all its English translations. Or, or you know, if it's been translated into French, it'll be or Russian, it'll be there. You know, so you can just read it in any form you want. Yeah, see, oh no, that can't be right. Jay's blog, no. <laughs> I don't think that's right. Yes, do send the link, Sarah, please. Okay, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I say, Sarah, thank you very much for that. Um, just two questions, really. Um, is another question for merit, habits? Um, well, I think you're, you're picking on, up on something which you get in Dignica, that these things can become habitual. And that's, that's what Rajiv noticed in that passage about punya, that merit can become habitual in a good way. Mm. A bit like a path that you kind of always go to school on or always go to work on, you know, that you, you can actually just make a habit of doing something. And that's your merit. Yeah. And mm. as Rajiv says, it's very popular in, in Asia. It's very popular in the Deegan They don't underestimate merit in the Deegan it's very important, yeah. Okay. Just um, gradual step by step building up a merit, just of making offerings, you know, just, uh, it, it's like it becomes an ancestral home then. <laughs> My second question is, is chanting ever done with instruments? Yes, yeah. If you go to Asia, you get the whole spectrum. Mm. You get, uh, Supi music sometimes in the background or you get instruments or it's a really interesting question that yes you do sometimes get it because like you know you know for example in a church mm. thing and somebody's playing an organ or playing a piano no that's right you chant <coughs> you yeah our music do we just chant as it is 
But it's wandering there if it's ever done with music or instruments. It, it, it often is, and I think some purists don't quite approve of that, but you do it at ceremonies, you will get things like, like drums and music before and after the chanting. Um, I mean, it's felt that the chant itself is its own music by most people, but some people do, you know, mix it with songs or there are all sorts of things you can do with it. It's just a creative tradition, really, and you can do those things. But I'd say less, it is more just the voice because that's how it was for so long. Um, but that's a really interesting question, yeah. Yeah, there it is sometimes with instruments. Um, I've always thought merit is a rather limp translation for punya. My preferred one is karmic fruitfulness. <laughs> Much more kind of positive. <laughs> Abundant, even yes, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sort of growing something, yeah, yep. yeah. Because <laughs> merit suggests deservingness, which is not quite what it is. Mm -hmm. It's a natural, natural result. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for an absolutely wonderful, wonderful talk, and it's so interesting. Had absolutely no idea about this Nikaya book. Um, can you recommend a way of approaching it as someone who has never read it? Mm -hmm. I mean, indigestion, it sounds like it could be on the cards if you're not careful. Um, so mm -hmm. can you tell me how you would go about it if you're a new person to it? If I was completely new, I'd browse through it and look for something that, looked, that just attracted my feeling. I thought, oh, that looks interesting. And just read one and don't, and don't try to do more. I mean, I think the Siegel of Arda Sutta is a really good one. The one that Gwil talked about, because uh, that's how you behave to all your family members. And it builds up this mandala around you of all your family, friends and everything and how to behave within that. And you feel it's all the relationships are two way that they, your family helps you, you help your family. So that if, if there's anything wrong with, because I think in practice, most of our problems in meditation are, are other people's fault, aren't they? I mean, <laughs> when we get annoyed with somebody. Or, um, so it's, it's actually a very good way of setting yourself so that you're in a correct relationship with all the people you know. I thought of doing that one today, actually, but I think that's a good introduction. And having a right relationship with them. And each one of them is worth thinking about actually. And I would say that's a very good one because that's also a four dimensional mandala because you're, you sit in the middle of this uh, mm. and you think of all your relatives that way. So I think I'd probably start with that one myself, but, but I think just have a browse, see what you feel. Thank you. I've already you, done one. You've, you've looked at the, the universal monarch sutta, I think in the past. Oh, so that yeah. was one of them. And that's doing, building up a meditation of visual worlds, which you then dissolve. So we, they're all doing different things like that. Yeah. Uh -huh. so could you repeat the name of the one that you're suggesting today? Yes. If you look up Deegan uh, 30, um, 31, I think it is. Yeah. 31. Yeah. yeah that, you, that's a one great one. Yeah. I think I'd probably go for that one as, as how to behave to friends and family or how they, yeah. And what's particularly nice about that one is that the boy who the Buddha is teaching has just lost his father. He's bereaved. So he's worshipping the directions as a family duty because his father on his deathbed asked him to do it. So the Buddha doesn't say, no, don't do that come and join Buddhism and don't perform rituals or whatever. He actually says to him, well, why don't you try performing the rituals in this way, remembering all the different people in your family? So it was, it's a really skilled therapeutic method in a way for this fractured, you know, bereaved boy that he doesn't tell him to stop doing what his parents have asked him to do, because actually that's one of the instructions in the text to, to, to honor your parents' wishes, but he doesn't bind the boy to having to do this ritual. He actually says, well, why don't you try doing it in this way? 
So he kind of really enacts with the text what it is to act with and around people in a therapeutic way. It's like the whole of the directions become a way to, to change one's outlook. And he doesn't tell him to stop honoring the directions. So it's one. I, I it's my one of my favourite actually. That one, really wonderful. Yeah. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, much appreciated. Um, I first became aware of the variety within the Diga Nikaya when ploughing through Warder's introduction to Pali, because all of the readings he gets us to to do and translate are from the Diga Nikaya. Mm -hmm. it's kind of huge huge range in there and um, I've just kind of dug it out because he had something interesting to say as to why he chose the Diga Nikaya which was um, there are three reasons for using this firstly the pedagogical and I think there he's talking about the fact that because there aren't these um, compressed poetical um, phrases quite so much it's easier to get your head around the, the Pali um, Secondly, they're more interesting to read, which is often the case because you get these big, long um, descriptions and yeah. um, things. Um, and it's the third bit, really. Um, thirdly, that in the belief of the present writer, they are more authentic in their preservation of the utterances and dialogues of the Buddha. Um, could you say something about that? Are they more authentic? And, and why does Warder think so? Well... Um, I think this is thing is I, I should say that as soon as you open your mouth on this subject in terms of authenticity, you you know it, it gets into a kind of whole uh, net of views or net of uh, things. So I, I regard them as 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 authentic. They are the first listed, the first of the Nikais. Then there are some suttas which have very ancient elements that we can tell from linguistic, like some parts of the Parinibbana Sutta we can f detect very ancient linguistic elements, which suggests that, it, that those little elements are older. Some of them do seem to be a little bit later, actually. The, some bits of the Lekhana Sutta, the Sutta on the Marks, it do seem to be a bit later. But they're all broadly taken as roughly the same as the other major Nikayas in the canon. I mean, authentic what? <laughs> you know, I, I mean, they, they seem, they feel authentic to me. And I, no, I, I know what he means. You just somehow feel that there's an immediacy there. I think that's what he means. Yeah. They just feel authentic in that sense that you just, you're there when, when you, you read, the, you just feel they're, they're, you can just feel the story and the presence of the Buddha and things going on. That's my personal feeling. Peter Harvey probably knows much more about this than I do. <laughs> Does that answer the question reasonably, Simon? They have an inexplicable appeal, don't they? They just, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It does. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Veronica and then Diana, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, it filled in a few gaps for me, actually, um, Sarah, um, a number of things, actually. Um, obviously, my, one way I came to Buddhism was through studying the Vedas. Um, it really opened up my mind in, in advance. Um, and it was lovely to see that clip, actually. <laughs> I could see it again, um, because it linked it together. And in fact, I think, I don't know whether it's right to say that, that the Buddha was a Hindu holy man, in a sense, or mm -hmm. followed that path. Um, and he was in that Indian, you know, North Indian context, you know, of what was happening. And I saw the link between that and the chanting, which I'd seen as completely separate, something to do with Thai and Sri Lankan temples. Um, and so that, that, and hearing it and seeing it, so that was a lovely connection, um, you know, which, um, you know, brought it all together. And, and it reminded me very much of when I went on the Indian pilgrimage. And so some of us have done it, you know, to the holy sites. I was with Liz and I think, there was some other people here that we were with. And uh, the suttas, I'm not sure now, with the Diga Nikaya, uh, 
how much cultural context is in them. I know the suttas that I've read, it often remembers a place, um, the Bamboo Grove or Adams Peak or Nalanda or Srivati, and we went to those places. And also the human, you know, the, the uh, characters that uh, come up in, in some of these suttas and the lovely human questions as well. Um, and, and so just being reminded of that, um, somehow the suttas are quite real in a way that perhaps the Jataka tales, I was thinking actually in terms of a user's guide or uh, um, an accessibility to these texts because we do set up study groups for the suttas and once you get in there, it's great, but there's quite a barrier sometimes because mm -hmm. there's a lot of repetition, a lot of strange words. And, you know, for some beginners or, you know, uh, advanced beginners, it's a, it's a barrier. Mm -hmm. uh, but once you get in, it's a wonderful world, actually, not just of the Dhamma, but the whole world, you know, uh, at that time. So... Um, it made me it made me aware of that. In fact, it was suggested. Final point: some years ago, when I was involved in a bit of publication for young people, that why hasn't anyone done um, a, um, a sutras for for young people? Because the person who had the idea was an editor, and he said there's some fantastic characters in them, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know they actually could come very alive. Um, well, it sounds like a job for you, Veronica, <laughs> a little retirement job, I think. No, no, seriously, if you get a feeling to do something, so often it is what other people want and need. And I mean, I think not just young people, really. Um, I've, I've just written a book on the Deacon Nikaya because I just, you know, I just really wanted to, to get into it. And I just think that if people follow their feeling about what they want to write about and interest them, then write about the characters in the Deacon. I mean, just do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Just wanted to say quickly about Sutta Central, because I was, I was kept going to suttacentral.org and bringing up some transgender blog, <laughs> which was linked to Buddhism, but was very confusing. I thought, this can't be right. It's, it's suttacentral.net. So if anybody wants the... the ah, book, thank you. Because yeah. um, the other might be a little bit... Uh, Confusing. <laughs> Thank you, Diana. Matthew, did you have another point? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in these stories, does the Buddha perform any miracles? You know, like, mm. for example, Jesus Christ. Yeah. He's, um, Jesus Christ turned water into wine. Mm. Uh, Moses parted the Red Sea. When Moses wanted to free the, free the slaves from the mm. Pharaoh, he threw his staff to the floor and then the staff turned into a snake. Is there many stories like that? In, mm -hmm. in yes, lots of them. <coughs> he didn't think you should show off. But he, if you wanted to be accepted as a teacher in ancient India, you had to do something like that or else nobody would pay you any attention. You know, they, they, you had to do some miracle or something. So mm -hmm. he didn't do them to show off, but he would do sometimes do things like that, like go up to the heavens create a pillar of fire and a pillar of water and go to the heavens um, and things like that. But he said you should be very, very careful of these miracles in the Deganakaya, in the Kevada Sutta, because um, wow. you can use them wrongly or they can be open to abuse. And he talks about the main miracles you can perform. And, and the best one, he says, is the miracle of teaching. Right. It's just quite an interesting. It's quite an interesting observation because I was actually brought up Christian before coming over to Buddhism, and you know, mm -hmm. within within mm -hmm. within the Bible, there's quite a lot of miracles. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got Lazarus who comes back to life, mm -hmm. and there's all these kinds of different things. But whereas in Buddhism, there seems to be very little, if any, mention of these things at all. No, it's all there that, that, that you've encountered the Buddhism, which has been. Um, probably promoted in the 20th century because I think people felt a bit embarrassed by miracles. But there are lots of miracles go on. Laymen perform them. People perform them generally. Um, they do them uh, for fun, to, to exercise the mind, to enjoy the powers of the mind. 
uh, but also to loosen attachment to things. <coughs> because if you can transform things in a miracle, it means you won't be so attached to something. If I can transform my cup into uh, a piece of coal and back into a cup or whatever, these kind of miracles, it, it loosens, they're just ways of loosening attachment. They are described at, as, yeah. So it did, there are plenty. If you read all the commentary stories, there's miracles happening all the time. And there are plenty in Deganikaya as well. <laughs> oh, thank you. The Buddha often performs a miracle like going to visit somebody with the divine eye. Or he'll make a, my, a, my, a body of himself and go visit somebody who's upset or something. So they're, they're, they're miracles that are used to help people. Oh, I, I was kind of thinking more like he points at something and makes it vanish. Kind of that kind of miracle. Uh, yeah, no, he could do that. Yeah, he can do that. But what he'd do is he'd create an image of himself and send it. If you, It's a bit like posting yourself to another place where somebody's unhappy and he would just go and visit somebody and cheer them up or they, they, they do lots of things like that. But uh, there's one monk who is so pleased to get enlightened. He d decides to turn himself into 3000 monks. He was left behind in a monastery because he um, wasn't very good at being a monk and he's crying. And the Buddha comes up to him and said, why are you crying? He says, I'm so hopeless at meditation. I'm not getting anywhere. And the Buddha said, well, why don't you do this meditation? He gives him a little meditation. And the monk turns out to be so good, he becomes enlightened immediately. So when all the other monks come back from lunch, he decides he'd play a game on them. And he multiplies himself into thousands and thousands of replicas of himself. So they come back and they realize something's definitely happened. <laughs> so there's lots of things like that. Yeah, plenty of miracles if you like them. Yeah. I do actually, yeah. <laughs> they sort of speak to a part of the mind that other stories don't reach, don't they? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Hi, Sarah. Hi, hi, Roberta. Hi. Um, I know it's split into three sections. And yeah. I've read quite yeah. a few from each section, but I don't really understand, I don't know what the sections are. Um, right. Well, they could so have been arbitrary. Um, they, we, we don't know. The first one's called the Sila Canada, and it's about Sila, or loosely. Uh, mm. And the, it has a section about morality for monks, which is in all of those 13 sutras. And that seems to have remained quite stable historically. The middle section seems to have had all sorts of bits moved around, like the, the Universal Monarch Sutra was probably taken out of the, the Paranibana Sutra and things like that. But that's called the Maha section uh, division and I like that because all the texts in there are, are very big maha in all senses they're magnificent it's where you get the parinibbana the great king of glory you know they, they've just got a magnificent sense and then the last one is just called pakia or something after a chap and I don't know why but it's there there isn't an overt there isn't a stated section heading it doesn't have these are all the texts about the scandals or anything like right. that. No, no. Okay, just wondered. Yeah, if that answers Thanks. the question, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm asking a question a bit different, really, because I'm not that knowledgeable about text. I've mm. got, you know, I've got a why. I've got a, some idea, and uh, I'm drawn to the concepts, but I've not studied it basically yeah. Yeah. very much. So I'm, 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 I'm putting something different, really. My process here and. Um, I was aware that somebody asked how you put the hand up on the screen and uh, I had a dialogue with myself saying, I've learned how to do that. I want to tell people. I want to give. But then at the same time, I'm thinking, oh, no, what, will people think it's the right thing to do? It's not on the subject. And, and then I ended up deciding to do it anyway. I put it on the chat. Great. Uh, but what Thank I was you. aware of is I got into that and I stopped, lis I stopped being able to hear and listen. Mm. So I kind of went into this, felt well, in my body, in my head, went into this dialogue about should I have done that, wanted to do it, and got pulled into that. And I was trying to pull my back self to listen. So, so I guess my question is, is there anything in what we've looked at today 
or, or uh, that would maybe describe where I'd gone to with that. I, I seem to get attached to something. Well, I, you sounds to me like you're basically a very generous person, and that the that was a great act of generosity to tell people about the. I, th I think let's start at the beginning there, which is that you had an impulse to be generous to people mm -hmm. and let them know about the hand signal, and the prevarications afterwards were various sorts of doubts, like being lost. Diganakaya says it's like being lost in a wilderness when in Sutta 2 they talk about the way uh, doubts can come up, like feeling a bit lost in a wilderness. Mm -hmm. But you found your way through because the other thing is that in Diganakaya, journeys end well where there is good intention. Ah. And uh, your intention was clearly wholesome, helpful, and I didn't know that about the reality. Yeah, I'm just reading it. Mm -hmm. um, so you ignore the doubts, basically. Mm hmm Okay, thank you. No probs. <laughs> they're, they're, they're no problems at all. That's just, we all do that because we don't want to intrude on a, you know, particularly if you're new to a, a, a particular online chat thing, you feel, oh, should I do that? But that's just being generous. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 want to, I want to nominate you for Order of the Merit, if I may. With uh, <laughs> Peter Harvey's translation of it. <laughs> oh, the merit, the yes, the, the uh... yeah, and and just uh, on something briefly that Matthew said earlier about the music on the Vegas Vaders. Um, there, there was um, I was just listening last night as it happened to uh, Radio Three, and um, they had a feature uh, about drones, and uh, uh, they they had uh, it as an accompaniment as a meditative as a meditative support uh uh which i thought was really interesting late last night Drones. Mm. yeah and um uh and then also on on the, the, the aspect of storytelling that there was um, an interview i heard with uh this terrific British storyteller called Daniel Morden. And he was in America and he's done um, uh, the, long, the, the long Homeric ones. And he's being interviewed uh, on, by this American man towards the end of the show. He says, well, we've got, we got five minutes left, uh, Daniel. Could, could, you do, could you tell the story of the Odyssey? Kind of a quick version. <laughs> and... Uh, and uh, the storyteller was very, very good. He, he said in the most brilliant way, look, he said, uh, the whole point is that when I do the two and a half hour long version, you feel that you've been on the journey. Mm, yeah, yeah, now, yeah. Is what yeah. I was saying uh, uh, at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. That's a really good way of putting it. Yeah. yeah. It, it, and the way he dealt with it as well and said, well, I'll tell you a short story instead, you know. Uh, afterwards yeah so uh, yeah th thanks and uh, I, I do I do appreciate those um it's happened before just when there's a key word like merit and um, come up, comes up and and there's another uh chance to review it with a different translation and it just ricochets cascades through uh, uh another understanding of um I, I even wrote it down. Uh, I'm afraid, unlike, unlike what you said, Lance told you on that night. <laughs> I did have to make a note. Yeah, karmic fruitfulness spreads on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I'll, I'll stop droning. <laughs> well, no. Thank you about the, the going on the journey. That's what the Deegan and Kai helps yeah. us to do. Thank you. At all senses of the word. Yeah. So, shall we, any more, or shall we have a, a blessing at the end? Ah, oh, I can see a hand by a fish. <laughs> yeah, it's me, yeah. Uh, oh. I wanted to ask a question. Uh, there yeah. are two suttas in the Diga Nikai by Venerable Sariputta. Yeah. The, uh, the Sangeeti Sutta and the yeah, Dasarath. Yeah, yeah. Are they, uh, could, to what extent do they represent the, the origins of the Abhidhamma? I think they must to a certain extent, yeah. But it, not just the Abhidhamma, the suttas. I mean, they must be some sort of enactment. These are the two suttas at the end. 
we're left, we start off the Deganakaya with the Buddha and the two suttas at the end leave us with the teaching. And it's quite an interesting that uh, there's the crisis, the center of the Deganakaya is the Parinibbana, but at the end you're left with the teaching. So I think it's not only, personally, I think it's not only the beginning of the Abhidhamma, but the beginning of the Sutta method too, just... But, but, but would you link them to the Abhidhamma specifically as well, because they're effectively numerical lists? I, I, I'm not sure, possibly, I'm not sure. I would, I link, I would link it specifically to Anguttara Nikaya, I mean, to, to Suttas, and to a certain extent the Abhidhamma, yes, yes. <laughs> Isn't Sariput uh, accredited with? Yes, uh, that's a very interesting point. I will, think, I, I, I will think about that, Rajiv, because the the Sariputta does have an association with incipient Abhidhamma. So I think yes, okay. there's, that's a All strong right. likelihood. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. That's interesting. Yeah. I think mean, that's a good time to pause now. Yeah. No. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Should we have a blessing at the end? Uh, somebody. Uh, Mark, would you like to chant a blessing there? Yeah. Bow to Sabba Mangalang Rakan to Sabba Devata Sabba Buddha Nubawena Sada Soti Bawan to Day Bow to Sabba Mangalang Rakan to Sabba Devata Sabba Dhamma Nubawena Sada soti bawan to day. Bawa to sabba mangalang rakan to sabba day wata. Sabba sangha nu bawena. Sada soti bawan to day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.